Chapter 11, The Hearing, 1933. The judge held up the document, Rush versus Schneider. He called into the court chamber. Then he absorbed himself into the papers in front of him. An attorney in a wide robe opened the swinging door leading to the witness box. His eyes, he directed Herr Schneider out of the public portion of the courtroom into the witness box. Herr Schneider stepped alone to the judge's table and waited. If it weren't for his constantly trembling fingers, one would have considered him calm. Herr Rush's attorney placed himself opposite Herr Schneider. The judge looked up and quietly instructed the court stenographer about what to take down. After he had done this, he turned to the attorney. Counselor, he addressed him, I miss the legal argument behind your submitted writ of complaint. You move on behalf of your client that the apartment now inhabited by the defendant, Herr Schneider, be vacated because of stress on your client, Herr Rush. You do not, however, specify what this stress consists or has consist of. The attorney bowed to the judge, his hand gripping his robe and tugged it close over his chest. Leaning back, he began to speak. Your Honor, a most extraordinary case is connected with our plea for eviction, but the legal aspect is quite clear. My client says claim to a right which must surely be granted every German today. We, the plaintiff and I who represent him, are aware that we are treading on virgin ground as far as the law is concerned, but even in Roman law, the judge, the judge cleared his throat. This created a short pause, and he interrupted the speaker. One moment, please, Counselor. Under the statute covering civil suits, we are required to settle the matter at dispute as quickly as possible. If you go back as far into the past, I fear we will read several days. I must, therefore, ask you to present the facts briefly. Pretending to be conscience-stricken, the attorney lowered his head until his chin touched his chest. Then he leaned back again, tugged at his robe, and began afresh. I watched, excited. I had never been in a courtroom before. Mother clung to my hand. It was a new experience for her, too. Herr Schneider asked us to come, just in case. In the seat next to my mother crouched Frau Schneider. Her whole body trembled. She was so nervous. Friedrich sat close to her. Eyes wide with fear, he looked in turn at his father, the judge, and the attorney. For a year now, the attorney was saying, my client has been a member of the National so Socialist German Workers' Party of our highly reverend Chancellor of the German Reich, Adolf Hitler. At these words, the attorney had snapped to attention and clicked his heels together. Then he resumed his old position and continued to talk. My client believes with all his heart in the philosophy of the Nazi party and is convinced of the correctness of its teachings. He stepped back, let go of his robe, and pointed an admonishing index finger at the courtroom ceiling. Waving his hand in the air, he continued, And a substantial part of the National Socialist ideology consists of the rejection of Judaism, Your Honor. As if he were dueling, he set one foot forward and pointed at Herr Schneider. He raised his voice. Your Honor, the defendant is a Jew. The attorney fell silent. The judge looked at the attorney, then at Herr Schneider, and finally at the public. The attorney began again. In a voice that sounded as if it would break, he imploringly called into the courtroom. Can my, can my client be expected to keep as a tenant in his house someone whom, according to the basic principles of his party, he must regard as an affliction to his nation as a constant threat of danger? My client feels the presence of a Jew in his house constitute a continuous strain under the provisions of the tenant protection law. We therefore move that the accused... The judge lifted a finger. Defendant, if you please... Counselor, he corrected, the defendant. Looking contrite, the attorney admitted his error. Of course, your honor, the defendant. I ask your forgiveness. He took a deep breath and continued in an even louder voice than before. We therefore move that the defendant be instructed to vacate the apartment he now inhabits and that he further be ordered to pay the cost of this hearing. The judge motioned to the court stenographer. Then he turned to Herr Schneider. What is your response? Herr Schneider moved restlessly back and forth in her seat. Beside her, Friedrich sat stiffly upright. Behind us, some spectators whispered to each other. Mother squeezed my hand still harder. In a firm voice, Herr Schneider replied, I move that the case be dismissed. The plaintiff has always known that I am a Jew. Until a short time ago, he found nothing wrong with that. The judge bent slightly forward. How long have you lived in the house of the plaintiff? 
he asked. For about ten years, was Herr Schneider's reply. Looking at the attorney, the judge inquired, Does the defendant speak the truth? The attorney tried to catch Herr Resch's eye. Is this true? he asked. Puffing, Herr Resch got up from his bench. Breathing hard, he slowly walked to the front of the courtroom. Johann Rush, he introduced himself to the judge, I and the plaintiff. The stenographer took down his name. What do you have to say about this? the judge asked. Herr Rush folded his hands over his chest, gasped for air, and began. I am a convinced National Socialist. Through my own personal effort, I want to help accomplish the party's goals. The Jew Schneider prevents me from doing this. His presence in my house will prevent party friends from visiting me, but not only party friends will stay away. My business friends will not come either. Your Honor, this Jew will ruin my business. Every reader of our party newspaper, paper, Der Sturmer, knows about the devastating effect of the Jews on our economy. The judge interrupted Herr Resch. Just a moment, please. Refrain from giving political speeches, please. Limit yourself to the case at hand. My question is still unanswered. Has the defendant lived in your house for ten years, as he says, and you have always known that he is a Jew? Herr Rush stepped closer to the judge's table. Yes, but you know it was a different time then. Times have changed. Now I cannot tolerate a Jew in my house. The judge waved this aside and said to Herr Rush, since you became a member of the NSDAP, you cannot tolerate a Jew in your house. Can you assure me that in the near future you may not join a party which is against Catholics or vegetarians? If I accede to your claim today, you may stand before me in a year or two and demand a verdict against another tenant because he is a Catholic or doesn't eat meat. Herr Rush shook his head. But that's something quite different. At this, the attorney grisped his sleeve and pulled him aside. The two spoke together in hushed voices. Herr Rush gesticulated. His attorney kept trying to calm him down. The judge looked out of the window. The spectators were talking. Frau Schneider dabbed drops of sweat from her brow. Friedrich stroked her arm. Finally, the attorney walked to the judge's table and Herr Rush left the courtman. My client has empowered me to retract his claim, he declared. He will bear the cost. With a bang, the judge closed the folder. From the pile in front of the room, he picked up a new one and prepared to call the next two parties. Herr Schneider bowed to the judge. All at once, Friedrich cried out. Herr Frau Schneider put her hand over her mouth. Everyone looked at us. The judge took off his glasses and his eyes searched the courtroom. Who was that? he asked. My son, Herr Schneider answered. Come up here, my boy, the judge called. Herr Schneider collected Friedrich and let him, led him to the judge's table. Friedrich was still crying. Why are you crying, eh? The judge asked warmly. You don't have to worry. Nothing will happen to you. That's why I'm here, to see that justice is done. Friedrich wiped his eyes and said, You, yes.